Well, first off, um, how are you? I'm not a public speaker, so uh, I hope you guys aren't expecting too much. Um, I was asked to come and share a little bit of um, um, my um, our story of how the business got started and things like that. And so I'll start with that, and then I'll um, um, and then we'll uh, have some questions and answers. And if that's okay with everybody. Um, ever since I got married, I kind of dabbled in weird little businesses and went to Utah State and uh, at the same time was grow raising a family, growing a family, you might say, and um, I think it took me nine years to graduate from Utah State because I took a lot of night classes and that was to get a bachelor's, not some master's or doctorate. That was a nine-year bachelor's degree. Um, and all through that time, I was always experimenting with different business concepts. Um, out of when I was in college, up at Rick's College, I ran a window cleaning business, and my wife was pregnant at the time, and my partner's wife was pregnant, and so we called it Future Dad's Window Cleaning. And our little tagline is "We're expecting your business," and uh, <laughs> and you know we'd go to these ladies' houses, knock on the door, and hand them our card, and ask for if we could give them an estimate. And by the time we were done walking around their house. They'd look at the card and say, now what's future dads? And we'd say, well, both me and my partner are expecting babies and this is how we're trying to pay for them. And they couldn't say no, and so we washed our windows. <laughs> um, and so we, we did that. Um, and then I moved to Log I, I uh, took a job selling office products for Corporate Express uh, and uh, moved to Wyoming for a little bit and then moved back here to Logan to finish my schooling. And uh, through that time, we ran a, my wife and I, out of our college apartment, we ran a craft business making wooden Christmas ornaments and selling them to places like, uh, there's a place in Salt Lake called Gardner Historical Village. There was a place here in town called Keepsake Cottage. And then someone said, man, you ought to sell these nationwide. And I'm like, how do I sell them nationwide? And so they hooked us up with, and we did a couple trade shows. We loaded up our minivan and drove to LA and went to a big, big trade show and went to Dallas and went to a trade show and then we had reps asking us, hey, can we rep your stuff? And I'm like, what do you mean rep our stuff? How do you do that? You know, well, we take it and show it to accounts and if we write an order, you give us a commission. So we did that. And, um, started hiring some, we moved it out of our apartment. Um, I'm sure our neighbors thought we were crazy because we'd be out at three in the morning spray painting stuff and doing things and I think when we moved out, I didn't get my deposit back because I drilled. We we drilled a lot of holes in wood, and and I think the kitchen floor was full of holes because we'd go through the wood into the floor into the linoleum. Um, of course, our family kept growing, and um, and I got into uh, had an opportunity to sell knives, and so I started selling knives. These are really abridged, but I had a buddy that lived in Alaska and. Had another friend that did these cool knives, and I said, oh, "Hey, I want to go see my buddy in Alaska. Can I take some of these knives and see if I can sell them and try to it accomplish two things? It made my wife think I was going there on business, and and also uh, paid for my trip. And uh, got back and found out the buddy that was making the knives didn't want to ship them and this and that. And so I had all these accounts in Alaska that kept calling me saying, "Hey, I want more." And and so I started a knife business and. Um, over the course of a few years, I um, that I did knife that did displays. He was out of Bountiful, and he did wooden displays like you'd see, like in a jewelry store, or whatever. And he saw the knives, and he said, "Man, I've got some good friends that that are that are uh, filled and stream. And you, you got to sell your knives to filled and stream." And so I said, "Well, set up an appointment. Let's talk." And so I, we met with them. And um, Field and Stream is a, is a licensing company. Mm -hmm. What they do is they license the name Field and Stream. And uh, through that, um, um, I started doing Field and Stream knives and sold into Sam's Club. And I did one deal, and I share this with you. I don't share this with a lot of people, but because of the purpose of this class, um, I literally, my first knife deal I did for Field and Stream was 40,000 knives to Sam's Club. Um, 
sourced them out of China, never been to China, designed it on a Photoshop on my computer, basically sitting in my underwear in my basement. And the profit on that was about $200,000 profit. And I kind of caught the bug right then. I thought, wow, this is pretty, and I'll bet I didn't spend 20 hours on that deal. It was literally just knowing the right people. And um, I even didn't see the knives, because what it was, it was a part of a gift set that other field and stream, <laughs> uh, other field and stream licensees, like there's a watch company out of Florida called Igana, and they wanted to put a knife with their watch and with this money clip, and they had to buy the knife from me because I was the licensed field and stream knife guy. And so I really didn't even see the knife until it was in our local Sam's Club here, and I walked in there to check out how it all looked and finalized. I'd seen pictures of it and stuff, but. Um, but a lot of that came because of just great relationships that I'd built with uh, these guys. Um, through that Field and Stream relationship, that was about the only knives I really sold under the Field and Stream name is that deal to Sam's Club. Um, when that happened, I quit my office supply selling job and thought, uh, well, no, I didn't quit it. What happened is the um, president of Field and Stream contacted me and said, Scott, you need to come to Vegas and meet with these guys. We're having a a licensing meeting and these guys from a company called Swank out of New York want to meet with you. And I said, well, I did a Google of Swank and I found out that they sell leather goods under the name Kenneth Cole, Tommy Hilfiger, Pierre Cardin, Jeffrey Bean, um, Nautica, a whole bunch of brands. And I thought, why would they want to talk to me? You know, I'm just selling knives out of my basement type of thing. And <coughs> I flew to Vegas and had dinner with them, and they said, we're looking for someone to do design work for us. And what had happened is, in their business, you know, these fashion brands is, what's happened with major retailers is they really kind of control the market. So like you'll have your Federated's, and your, which owns most of your department stores, like Dillard's and May Company, and, and they start really dictating to the these companies like a swank that listen, we're going to send you all the product back. We want advertising dollars. So the margins were just shrinking. And so they thought, let's try doing field and stream leather goods, wallets and belts, and, and try to into a different market that's maybe not as competitive, like the Cabela's of the world or the sporting goods stores. But they were a bunch of big city New Yorkers, never even you know, been to the West, didn't know, and what they, the reason they wanted to meet with me is they loved the packaging and the design I did on my own products, and they said, would you give me some renderings, or can you come with some concepts, some ideas of how you would package a wallet and a belt and this and that, and I thought, man, this is an opportunity, so I spent two or three days at Kinko's and printing on cool paper and on old rusted, you know, metal, I took like these little tabs like they use for scrapbook. The gal at the scrapbook store probably thought I was weird because I'm in there, I'm not in the scrapbook and I'm going, hey, these are cool little, you know, fasteners and stuff. Made this presentation and I just walked in there and, and said, hey, uh, here, you said you wanted some packaging concepts, here's what I was thinking. And uh, they went out in the room. One of them had flown in from New York. They have an office in Phoenix and, and I, that's where we met. They went out in the hall and I'm sitting in this little room and I thought, I gotta use the bathroom, so I went and asked the secretary, where's the bathroom? When I walked out in the hall, they're out there just kind of arguing about me. And I'm going, well, this is cool. And what they were doing is saying, we gotta hire this guy. And so I came back in the room and they said, we wanna hire you. And I said, well, I've got, there's no way. I, I've, I've always had this philosophy of, I wanna work to live, not live to work. And so I don't wanna move to New York or move to LA just because I can make more money there. I love Logan. I love. I was born and raised in Montana and I love the outdoors and and so they said, well how about as a consultant, would you work as a consultant? I'm like, well, what's that mean, you know? And uh, and then I, I kind of got nervous because they were talking big dollars and this. I said, no wait, I did this in my underwear in my basement. I don't have a studio or anything. I mean, I literally said that and they, and they laughed, of course, and they, they said, we don't care how you did it, we just like it. And so for about a year and a half, I went to New York about twice a month and sat down with them. I remember my first meeting out there. I'd never been to New York and uh, I take that back. I had been to New York one time but it was just for a few hours and uh, went into this big Park Avenue um, build, building and sat down and there's all these guys from India there who are their leather manufacturers. There's all these other people there and and 
and uh, they just from day one treated me like I was some expert and I pretended I was and we had a good relationship. Um, because they had these wallets there and uh, they said, what do you think of the line that the, their factory had already put together? And, and I sat and I looked at it and I just thought, this isn't what I envisioned Field and Stream to look like. It looked like what I call rubber tomahawk wallets, like you see like at the trading posts or the, the little souvenir shops that have like the beaded, you know, they didn't look like a like a Cabela's or like a real rich, like an Eddie Bauer or anything. And so um, I looked at all of them. There was probably 30 there. And I thought, I have nothing to lose, you know. And so I said, I, I really don't like any of them. And the guy um, who's the vice president of the company said, you're right. And said something kind of that I won't repeat here. And he said, they're all blank. And let's push them off the table. And we started designing wallets. I was supposed to fly home that night. End of the day, they said, can you stay till tomorrow? I said, sure. The next day, so they changed all my flight plans. And I remember going into him the second night. He said, can you stay one more day? And I said, well, and at the time, I still had a sales job selling office products. And so I said, well, I guess. And uh, when I tried to talk him out, I said, now, it's, it's going to cost probably $300 to change my ticket. And he's like, Scott. We're talking millions of dollars here. We don't care whether it costs a thousand dollars to change your ticket. And uh, I'll come back to that mindset a little bit later. So I worked for Swank. Um, one of the things I learned from Swank, and the reason I'm sharing all this is, um, big company. Literally, I think they did 150 million dollars a year in sales. Um, but they weird stuff though. They didn't have like a CD burner in the whole building. I'm like, I need to burn a CD, and they're like. No one had one. And other things like, when I had the craft business, my wife and I would get to like Dallas or to a trade show or I'd fly to Alaska to this little trade show they have there. And always, I was putting my brochures at Kinko's like at three in the morning and for the show that started. And, and I always would beat myself up going, man, I need to be better in this. Well, I started working for Swank and I was involved in their brochures for what they call the Magic Show, which is the, it's an acronym for the Men's, the Men's Apparel Guild in California. It's a big fashion show in Las Vegas. They fly me down there, put me in this, but at the time it was a 1,250 foot suite at the Venetian. I mean, my house was only 1,900 square feet. It was a pretty big room. <laughs> and, uh, um, and there I was. At, four or five in the morning printing brochures at Kinko's. I thought, these guys aren't any better off than, than my little craft business that my wife and I ran. And uh, so that lasted. It was a great relationship. But, um, and they kept saying, you know, Scott, we need you to go to India. And, and then they'd say, oh, no, never mind. Or we need you to go to China. And will you run? And well, I remember going and getting like this overnight visa, or this 24-hour, 48-hour visa. And then they canceled the trip. And of course, I was excited. I was getting on. Google in China and find it out and then and so finally I just said you know what and I told because I was just a consultant for them I wasn't I didn't have set hours or anything they would give me sometimes they'd call me at five in the evening and say hey we have a meeting tomorrow with Target can you put together some box ideas and and uh, so I'd mock up some stuff and what happened is after I got done with all the field and streamline, which I was really comfortable with, they started asking me to do like Kenneth Cole and some other stuff that really, I'm kind of a Billy Bob, I didn't really know that lifestyle. I didn't understand, they, he'd say it needs to be more cosmopolitan. I'm like, what did you say? How do you pronounce that, you know? Or it needs to be more contemporary. And I'm like, what's contemporary, you know? And so I really kind of, it was just hard. It, it became harder to do design and, and they became more demanding and, and uh, and so anyways, I'm probably boring you with all this. Um, I told my wife, and it might as well, I said, I'm going to try, I'm going to just go to China and see what it's about. I'm going to, there was a gift show in Hong Kong. I said, I'm going to fly over there and go to this show and just experience it. And, um, bought a ticket, flew over there. It was the worst 16 hours of my life because I'm a pretty big guy and I flew coach and... <laughs> I think they put me next to the only other American. You know, these Asian people are nice and short, and but I was next to this big woman. I ended up standing about eight of eight hours of the flight, and uh, 
and I just got there. I'm like, now where do I go? What do I do? But it was a great experience, and I was able to meet some suppliers and kind of get a feel for it, how things, because that's kind of what Swank had done for me, is I was able to see that a business that size had the same problems as my little craft business that my wife and I ran out of our garage. And started to realize that, wow, if these guys can do it with all their flaws and all the, because I started to not be critical, but I started going, wow, this is a huge company and they're doing it this way, this is kind of weird. So anyways, um, jump, on, jump ahead a few months later and I'll tell you how Reminder Band started. What happened is, um, I was sourcing knives, still working on some concepts for hopefully to try to get it like another Sam's Club deal or this or that. And uh, oh, by the way, I'd quit my job at Corporate Express as soon as Swank offered me a job. So I had this consulting job, and and I'll tell you, they paid me like seven thousand dollars a month to to um, just be available and make a. Sometimes I wouldn't hear from them for two weeks, and I'm going, wow, this is this is a good deal, you know. And so it was, it, it was uh, I thought, well, I guess I can quit my other job. And uh, so I was spending my, a lot of my days doing work for them, but also dreaming up other ideas. And one day, a good friend of mine came into my shop. And this is after the Livestrong bracelets had really kind of become popular. And he came into my shop. I had a shop down by LW's on 10th West. And uh, he said, I need to get wristbands for Utah State. He was working for a company that sold ad specialties do you have a contact in China that can get him? I said, that's odd, because I was just asking her last night, via, or two nights ago, via email, if they could get these. And so, um, so we started working on trying to get samples for Utah State. And there was some politics going on at the time. I hope no one in the room here was involved in it. But um, when you do stuff for, for, obviously, for the college, you have to go through the office of uh, purchasing, make sure that, especially if it's over a certain dollar amount, has to be going out for a bid and this and that. And, and uh, at the time, this was just three or four years ago, the student body president or, or the student, the officer that was in charge of this project had kind of already committed them to another friend. And then my friend that w wanted me to source them for him said, no wait, these have to go out to bid. Well, one thing they did is they in turn said, well, in order for us to give you the bid, even though you're the best price, we, got to see a, we have to see a sample. Well, at the time, you couldn't even get a Livestrong bracelet. Like, you couldn't just, you'd, you could buy them on eBay for 20 or $30, or they were really hard to come by right at that time. And, um, and, I, and I took a, um, they said, we need it by next Wednesday. Well, this was, a, it was like a week. It was on a Wednesday. And let me tell you, let me back up just a little bit. When I was doing all this work for um, figuring out if we could do a Utah State wristband, I was thinking one day, what other phrase would go good on a wristband? It's kind of like live strong, you know, and I'm kind of thinking all these, and obviously being living in Utah, I thought, what about choose the right? And I remember where I was. I was at Carl's Jr. Um, <laughs> and you guys are adults, so I'm going to share the whole story. We have seven kids, and I just had a surgery, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, so, so we didn't have any more kids, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I'm sitting at Carl's Jr., and I thought, I'm going to call Desert Book. So I had this little phone book in my car, and after I'd ordered, I called Desert Book, the lo local store, and they gave me the number for Salt Lake. And, and within the, within the hour, I'd called the local this office down there. I said, "Hey, is anyone doing wristbands that say Utah, that say uh, not Utah State, but choose the right on them?" Just a crazy idea. And the buyer who buys all the rings and stuff, she goes, "You know, we've got a vendor that's working on them, but um, and we're, we try to stay really loyal to our vendors." And so, appreciate the call, but we're not. In. And I said, "You know what? In today's day and age, and this is exactly what I said. And I think that there's a reason why it's important that." You, so I said, you know, in today's day and age, that's, that's cool to see that you guys are loyal to a vendor. And so I, I'm not even, I don't even produce wristbands. I just know I can get them done. And she said, well, why don't you give me your phone number just in case? And that was it. Well, skip ahead about three or four days, or maybe it was a week. I'm not sure. But we're working on this Utah State thing. And they said, we need to see a sample. Well, and so my... My friend is saying, you know, can we get a sample that says Utah State? Well, a mold costs about a, a thousand bucks to get a mold made because to make a wristband. 
And I said, his name's Clay. I said, you know, Clay, I hate to make a mold that says Utah State that's licensed that we wouldn't have permission to use if, if we don't get the bid. And the way it was looking is we were not going to get the bid because of some, pol some friendships and stuff. And I said, but does it have to say Utah State? And they said, no, it just has to show the quality. And I said, okay, well, got on the phone with my gal in China who I'd met on my previous trip, who I'd been correspondent, and I said, here's the deal. Oh, and she said, if you order 7,000 bands, you get the mold free. And I said, if you can get us samples by next Wednesday, I'll guarantee you 7,000 piece order. And, and we had a mold made that said, choose the right. And uh, this is almost an unbelievable story. I still don't believe it. You guys won't believe it either. But anyways, <laughs> um, Tuesday of the following week, I get a call from Desert Book, and they said, hey, this vendor's not coming through. Are you still interested in doing wristbands for us? And I said, well, yeah. And she goes, well, how soon? We've been waiting for over a month for samples. How soon could you get us samples? Because um, Thanksgiving's coming. We want to have them for Christmas. And I said, you know what? If FedEx doesn't get held up in customs or whatever, I could, I have some samples coming tomorrow for Utah State. Can I, if they come in, can I drive up down and see you? And she said, well, sure. So I drive down, so sure enough, they come in, there's about eight of them. I give four to my buddy and four to me, and I drive to, down to Salt Lake and meet with Desert Book. And she thought they'd say Utah State. They said, choose the right. So she was blown away. You know, she's like, how'd you do those so fast? You know? Because <laughs> what my idea was is if I had 7,000 bands, I know, I know where some Mormon kids are. I think I could sell these <laughs> in my own neighborhood. I mean, I've got seven kids of my own, so it's 1,000 bands apiece. Um, um, I left there with an order for about 20, and, here, and here's how it transpired. She goes, what do you think you can sell them to me for? I said, what do you think they'll sell for? She goes, well, we think we could sell them for a buck 99, but I think they'd sell better at a buck 50. And I said, okay, what type of price, what type of margin do you like to make? She goes, well, we like to at least Keystone, which is double. And I said, okay, so if they sell for a buck 99, I'll sell them to you for a buck. If they sell for a buck 50, I'll sell them to you for 75 cents. And she said, yeah, that works. And I said, okay. So we went with 75 cents and they sold them for buck 49. And um, their initial order that I left her office with was 21,000 pieces, or 20,000 pieces, something like that. And by the time I got home, she'd already called some of the other desert bookstores and the order ended up being 35,000 pieces. <coughs> My buddy went to Utah State. The afternoon, he had an order for 10,000 pieces. He, he, he sold them to Utah State for 39 cents though, so he didn't make near the profit I made. But anyways, um, so we placed those orders and one thing, we, as we, as I was doing some research about wristbands, I found these bulletin boards that were up at the time of people saying, does anyone know where you can get wristbands? You know, one was like, I remember one in particular was this, um, some Christian academy that wanted them that were like for abstinence that said, I'll wait till I'm married or something. And we only need 300 and everyone's telling us we have to buy at least 7,000 and, you know, is, can anyone do them for less? Or is there anyone? And these were like on these bulletin boards of like under fundraisers and all these different. And so I thought, man, there's got to be a way that you could do these less, even though I didn't even know the process that was going on in, in China. And we got this crazy idea and we went and kind of investigated it. And we figured out a way where you could put the debossing, you guys know what the wristbands are, right? If you don't, then you've been, where have you been living? Because they're everywhere. <laughs> well, they were everywhere. Um, we figured out a way to put the debossing, um, the sunken letters into them. And as all I can share with you, because it's our trade secret, is be the equivalent instead of uh, instead of uh, like if you wanted an ice cube that, s that said USU on it, you could get the ice cube tray molded that says USU on the inside, the reverse of it, and then make the ice and then pop them out and it'd say, or you could say, let's just take regular ice cubes and figure out a way to melt it in there, okay? That's what we did. And so we created a way where we could order blank product from China and then you could say, hey, I, don't, I want 20 of them, and we'd do 20. No mold cost of $1,000. And we set up a website. Our website was a cost, our initial website cost us $500. And the business just blew wide open. Literally, um, within four months, we had um, about 30 employees. Um, 
it got so bad that my my cell what happened is we had to take the 800 number off the off the website because we just couldn't keep up and we said let's have and that's what we were kind of copying what Livestrong did they just said they had an email thing that says sorry we can't take any phone calls just email us and we'll try to get your order one of the challenges was is at the time the people that were ordering wristbands were like um, PTA presidents cheerleading coaches basically the people that just are kind of annoying in the first place. I mean, no, <laughs> what I meant by that is the people that are very aggressive that like they place their order the next day they call you. Can, are our wristbands coming? Our girls are really excited to get in the, yep, they're, we'll have them in, you know, they'll ship in three days, this and that. And so it really overwhelmed our system. We had times where we had, you know, this hundreds and hundreds of emails. And what had, what had happened is, I'd taken all these bulletin board postings and cut and paste their email address and then I did a mass email to them and there was probably 50 of them. Well, ironically, one of the guys that contacts me, because I emailed them and said, hey, I found a way to do wristbands. One of the guys that contacted me was the vendor from Desert Book that was trying to do wristbands for him. <laughs> and I remember standing at Walmart and him going, well, I don't really want to share with you who the customer is because you're from Utah too and he was from... He goes, but they need to say choose the right. And I said, no, wait, I've already got a 30,000 piece order from Utah State. And he's like, he got all upset. He goes, they told me they'd be loyal, this and that. And I said, and I'm thinking, oh, no, he's going he's gonna to ruin this order for us. So I said, hey, I've got a call coming. Let me, I put him on hold, and I called Desert Book, and I told her exactly what was going on. I said, I've got this guy on their line. Anyways, um, so here, two or three weeks into it, he was still trying to find bands for them. But anyway, so... Um, that business in um, um, in the first year, um, I think we did around. Um, I'm leery to share numbers because I don't want to make it, but I think it's important to illustrate. It was over ten million dollars in sales the first year, just phenomenal, and through that we started getting worldwide order. Well, about three, three or four months into it, we couldn't keep up with the production here. And so we went and took the production to China and taught them the same process that we were doing locally. Then we, and then a few months after that, we thought, well, why are we shipping them from Hong Kong to Logan to repackage them to ship worldwide and work with FedEx and literally set up a global shipping system out of Hong Kong, got an office in Hong Kong, hired some people there, and so if my next door neighbor ordered wristbands, they came not from Logan, but they came from our Hong Kong office. And, um, and we still have the Hong Kong office as, acts a, a, as a huge part of what we, we do now. Um, still sell a lot of wristbands to this day. Reminder Band is the, the site. People can get on now and order as few as one. Um, the market's changed a lot. Originally, there was a there was a time when the market was kind of like you'd see them at the college bookstore and you'd, it's really now kind of a niche market where like if a soldier's being deployed, people will buy them. By the way, what time? I, I probably, I'm not, okay. Um, people are being deployed or this or that, they'll get online and order 50 that say, pray for, for private Jones or, you know, um, um, a lot of tragedies, like if someone dies in an accident, we'll, you know, we'll uh, do them. Um, um, we did a lot for Utah State when the bus, when they had the bus tragedy, we donated all those to the, um, so that's Reminder Band. Well, what happened is as our processes got better and as we thought, wow, we started with a lot of people because we didn't have good processes, but we thought, what do we do now? We've, we've got all these people working for us. We really need to try something new. And, and also, we thought that the wristband could be a real craze. It could be hot and then die tomorrow. Um, um, and so the idea came up that, why don't we do iPod accessories? There's a lot of silicone iPod accessories out there. And the idea that I had was, well, we can't just do another iPod accessory because we're late to the market. There's already a lot of people doing them. And so we took some of the know-how, what we already had, and the relationships we already had with the, the factory, and 
put together a patented process that was a three component iPod case that could only be sold online or purchased online. And we started a website called iFrogs. And let me show you that. Um, can, can I hit some of these lights? Is that okay? Um, so this is iFrogs, and this is our. Um, is that okay if it's off all the way? Yeah. The colors look so much more vivid. And, um, so this is iFrogs, and what, what we started with iFrogs is because we understand we understood online ordering process. We thought, well, let's let's do a build process. And so, if you go to products, you can go into like. Um, and this was the all these other products you're seeing right now aren't part of. Uh, so this was the concept. Is what you do is you come in and you say, okay, I want a case that's uh, yellow. Oh, I must select the size. I want a yellow case and I want a purple band on it. And then we design, uh, had a concept called wheel art or navigation art. And when you pick your navigation art, you, uh, and then you can view both sides of the case. And then when you're ready, you just hit buy set and you've built your own case. When you do all the math and add up all the different colors and all the different wheel art, we've got sports. So like, and one of the ideas is like, so say you, you want to show your Aggie spirit, you could say, okay, I'm going to do, the, and I'm going to put the basketball in there. <laughs> and you notice I didn't mess with football. Um, or you could reverse it and say, I want a blue band. and. And uh, and that really took off. We literally, I think the first year we had 50 something thousand orders. Um, hired some good people, search engine optimization. If you go into Google, let's see. Uh, I haven't checked this for a month or two, but does everyone understand search engine optimization? You do? Well, I actually ran into, is it Neom? Neom. Yeah, Neom. I flew with them. Really? Yeah, had his brain for like three hours. He's a genius. Yeah, he is. In, in search engine optimization, because what it is is based, search engine optimization is building your website so that the, the search engines find it, see it, but also it's very important. It's a, it's an art, especially in a competitive industry like iPods. You know, so if I go to Google and you know there's paid advertising, but this is actually the organic. So if I go into Google and I type in iPod cases, which is a highly competitive term. See right here under the, these are, these first, where the cursor is, these are the paid ads, but under the first organic, we're actually above Apple, which that's a huge feather in Neum's cat. <laughs> if you look over here, there's 2,920,000 results for that phrase, iPod cases, and iFrogs is number one. That's really important to our success. Um, so, I, iFrogs uh, started, did really well. Um, just online, we'd have people, um, uh, if I had my laptop, I have my laptop, but if it was plugged in, I could show you our order process where anywhere in the world I can get on and I could see every order that drops in, whether it was yesterday or two minutes ago. Um, and did some cool things, like you can actually even come in here and you can design your own wheel art, upload custom image. I can browse, now this is a, I'm not sure if there's any JPEGs on here. Um, so, but you can pull down an image, a picture of your dog or your car or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or, and you can create this wheel art and order it. It's all printed one up in China, right from the factory, sent to you. Um, what happened with, with Reminder Band is the Chinese, the way they work is they're all about mass production, all about 10,000 of this, 10,000 of that. Well, because of our success with Reminder Band, we kind of taught, at least our factory, a new way of thinking that, no, you can still produce. In the peak of Reminder Band, I think our busiest day, we did um, 200,000 wristbands. And now, there's a lot of companies in the wristband industry that say, oh, we do a million wristbands. But those were like big orders, like for McDonald's, that they might have sold to McDonald's for 12 cents a piece. We were selling bands for 250 a piece, and our average order size was like 120 bands, you know? So when you, when you do 200,000 bands and it's 50 of this and 500 of that and 1,000 of that and 300 of that, it's a big difference than you know, a million bands for the Utah Jazz that's, you know, or whatever. Um, 
And so the, the factories really bought on because the concept I said to them is, listen, instead of you doing these bands for, um, these aren't real prices, but I'm just going to, instead of you doing for a penny and doing 10,000, wouldn't you like to make a nickel if you'll just do 20 for me? But I can still give you 60, 80,000 wristbands a day, just like the, and so to this day, our factory is still strong and, and we still do a lot of wristbands because a lot of the competition has fizzled away because the market's changed and the market isn't there anymore for doing 10,000 Utah jazz bands. I, uh, you can probably find a band in the, on the campus that says Utah State on it. Um, with someone wearing it, maybe, but it's just the market's changed there. So with iFrogs, where we're at right now is um, for a year we did, we launched iFrogs in March of 06. And um, for a year, got some, uh, while I'm talking, I'll let you check out this cool movie. Not because it's that cool, but because we paid a lot to have it made. <laughs> and it might as well get some play. Um, for a year, it is cool though. Um, for, we took this to CES as a, uh, and it was playing on a big plasma above our booth and stuff. But um, for a year we did online sales and then we had a lot of people say, you really ought to take this stuff to retail. And so last year, uh, in uh, January of 07, we went to CES and Macworld's first time we'd ever done that. Um, introduced, and I'll show you that some of the product. We thought, how do you take, um, when you add up the possibilities with our online solution, it's like 300,000 different combinations. Um, when you mathematically take 500 pieces of wheel art and 40 colors of each of two different components. And I thought, how do you put that in retail? So we came up with a concept called a 30 design pack. And what it was is uh, was a case, 10 pieces of wheel art, a band, and then on the back, two more extra bands. So you could buy this at retail and go, oh, okay, well, I like this, but I want the white band, or I want this, uh, this whale on here instead of the star or whatever. So you could kind of dress your iPod like you want. One of our original taglines was different cases for different faces, and the idea was that, that a 10-year-old girl could put butterflies and flowers, and another kid could put skulls and crossbones and black and silver and whatever. Um, this bombed, this packaging, everything. And it was a phrase that I used, that I learned from Swank called understandability. They actually, we'd be sitting there and they go, they won't understand it. And I'm like, what do you mean they don't understand it? Cool concept. The idea was, man, you're getting this cheaper than you can just to get a single case. But people just didn't grasp it. It, 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 was, it was confusing at, at retail, point of purchase. I liken it to like if you went in to buy a frozen pizza and instead of having pepperoni or Supreme, they had a pizza that was uh, make your own and it had little, I mean all those toppings fall off anyways and you have to dig them out of the box. Um, so I, you could say, man, let's put pepperoni in one little Ziploc and mushrooms and, and they could buy that one box and just open that Ziploc and throw them on top of the pizza. Might work, great concept, but if, it, if they have the same experience we had, it's just not understandable. People don't want to They'll, they'll see it and go, what do you mean build my own pizza? I don't, I don't want to build it. I want to, if I want to build it, I wouldn't be buying a frozen one, you know, type of thing. So, so, um, so we launched, last year we got some real good retail presence in uh, Virgin, Ma uh, Virgin Mega Stores in the Middle East. Um, I got a call. They said, we want to place an order. I flew over to Dubai and met with them because this was our first big, and they put us in eight of their stores. And they have eight stores in the Middle East. and really did it upright. They did a lot of our imagery. Oh, let me tell you one thing about iFrogs that I think is important is um, um, we really try to pay a lot of attention to the fashion of the brand. How many of you in here have an iPod? Okay. How many of you have a Zune by chance? None? That doesn't surprise me. Um, and, and I'm glad that that's the case because I don't want to embarrass anyone. iPod has, Apple's really positioned them, themselves very, very well as being just a hip and a hot item. It's, it's fashionable to have Apple. Um, you know, when I was in college, that wasn't the case. It was the, it was the graphic designers and stuff that had Apple computers. Um, 
And we try to make sure our brand does that exact same thing. Because the analogy I use is if I'm at a trade show and let's say the booth right or I'm on a plane and the guy from the, I'm sitting next to Bill Gates and he goes, hey, this was fun talking to you. Here's a couple of Zooms. My kids would look at him and go, Dad, we don't want a Zoom. It's like taking them home a pair of tough skin Levi's or something, you know? They want what's hip and they want what's hot. And that's what we've tried to do with our brand is mirror it with that. Because iPod Apple is about lifestyle. It's about image. It's not necessarily about, even though there's lots of other gadgets out there that are better than the iPod from a, from a pure spec standpoint, battery life, all that. But they've done a great job at, at their image and the branding of it. So I'm going to wrap up. Let me show you. Our, um, this year we introduced the audio wraps. And uh, as you see here, it won some awards. What the audio wraps is, is we thought, what if we took a silicone case and we embedded a speaker into it. And uh, this, what, this project wasn't coming along. And uh, I've got a wonderful wife that, I mean, here I've got seven kids. And last year I was gone probably about 140 days, um, seven or eight trips to China, um, obviously the Middle East, Ireland, Germany, all over setting up these distributors. Well, about the second week of December, I called her on a Monday and said, hey, I need to go to China this week. And she goes, okay, when? And I said, probably tomorrow. Called her back after looking online and finding I couldn't find a flight. said, I need to go tonight. And 20 minutes later, she had my bag packed and I was on my way. And, uh, and it was to finalize this product. And, and at the time, there was people that didn't believe in it in, within the organization that thought, no, why are we wasting our that it's really, it's really become a great thing from us. Now in this room, you won't be able to hear it very well. And, and just to make sure you understand, there's no battery in it, there's no power source. What, with Apple, if you use a 30-pin connector like your iHome and a lot of those things, Apple requires you to pay a $4 royalty to them just for that connector, not, not even for the components, just a royalty because that's a proprietary 30-pin design for them. Now we could do it, and if you were like at a flea market or something, you might find something that's got a 30 pin that you don't have to pay the royalty on, but that's black market stuff, and your big retailers like Walmart, Target, they won't touch an item that's not made for iPod. So when you see that made for iPod, that's what it is. So what it is, it hooks to your, your, uh, your headphone jack, and you just put your, your, um, your nano in there, the, the new 3G nano comes in all different colors. There's a headphone jack down here. If you put your headphone jack in, your headphones in, the speaker doesn't work. Now don't expect hi-fi because there's no battery. It's the same. Okay. And uh, this cell, this is going to be in Walmart in a few months and it will sell for 19 bucks. So it's really, it's, cool. it's a cool item because if you're in your, you know, when you when I got the first prototype, I was in my hotel in China, and I'm like, wow, this is cool, because I don't know how many times I woke up midnight with my headphones wrapped around my neck, and, and, and so this, you sit on the nightstand or whatever, and, and um, another innovative item that we introduced, and it was in the Apple stores last year, and I'm, I'm running out of time here. By the way, I've got some product for you guys. I've got some gift cards. Every one of you, um, there's a $30 gift card. You can go on the website and use it as a, like a gift certificate. But, this is the tadpole. Um, 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 this is called the tadpole. My four-year-old daughter. <laughs> my four-year-old daughter took my son's video iPod, and he had on there a bunch of like SpongeBob and everything. And my house is pretty chaotic with seven kids, and she just sat there and was glued to it with little earbuds in here. And I thought, man, there's something there. And so I developed this product called the Tadpole. And what it is, it's, a, it's an iPod case that you put your, so mom can throw a video iPod in here with some kid content on it, little child headphones. And uh, kind of takes the DVD player in the car to the next level because you can be at the doctor's office, at church, at PTA meeting. Someone recently, well, Jody said that she took it to Hamilton's and her daughter, which Jordan's a nightmare. Just sat there and watched it for, and I believe in it because we have, we now have it. I didn't have it because we just sent the sample to radio to um, Apple. They're we're, they're meeting with Apple on Friday, Friday to present. We have this in the same format. It's a little tadpole, but it's got the built-in speakers, and it's awesome. My daughter sits and watches Shrek. 
she still sleeps with us. Well, just until she's asleep and then we move her. But she'll lay there and she'll fall asleep and it will fall down and put on the nightstand and off she goes. And so this has been, it, we're introducing it also in the touch. This is, a, it'll be a little bit bigger. But um, this is, this, this will be for the iPod touch. And it will have a case and things around it. But that's iFrogs and that's my story. I, so. Now, if you don't have iPods and you want to use this certificate, we also have a lot of apparel. Because um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're building the brand. Um, it's important when we go in and, and talk to the retailers and say, um, when we go into the retailers and talk, um, it's, imp it's important that we, when we tell them about the fact that we're a fashion brand, you guys will be honest, won't you? If these get to the end of the thing, and hit <laughs> it. Um, okay. Um, does anyone in here have a 3G Nano? The new 3G, the small Nano. Nobody. This one that goes to this. Okay. We are all in Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because I have some of these speaker cases too, but roommates that have them? Anybody? Okay, come up afterwards. I've got about a dozen of them here. I'd love to not have to haul back. So, or if the relative or whatever. Um, oh, do you have them? Yeah. Some are good. Some. Yeah, we've gotten into. We have a, a line of ear ear um, headphones called Ear Pollution. Um, This is the air pollution line right here. We've got a great graphic artist, can you tell? He does a great job. He actually teaches here at Utah State one night. In fact, tonight's the night he teaches. His name's Kent Worthridge. He's incredible. Um, are we done? I didn't leave any time for questions, did I? About 10, ten short. We do. Any questions? Uh, I thought of two questions. First of all, does, do the speakers drain your batteries any faster? They don't. But what they are, we, we sent it into a reviewer, the iLounge, that, that gave it best to show. Um, we sent it to iLounge and we said, you know, it doesn't require any power. And they like kind of rebuked us a little bit and said, well, it does too require power because your headphones require power. Well, I didn't know that. So it's the same power that your headphones take. In fact, I'll show you the module. So what it is, it's a, inside this case. Um, it's a, uh, and you see there's no place for batteries and it just has a headphone jack, so it really doesn't take any power. Um, the idea is there's lots of little mini speakers out there that you can get and plug in. The idea behind this was to always have it with you to be able to, uh, so you're not going, oh, I wish I would have brought my speaker because I want my friend to hear this or see this little movie. Or, and, uh, and so, um, so it doesn't have really, if the, uh, the, um, the, the touch has actually more volume. It's the exact same speaker set, but the touch has more output because the device has more output than the Nano. And so, and then it will be available in the Classic and, and the others, so. But. Any other questions? You have them there for your iPhones as well. What kind of cases and stuff you have on them? iPhones, we have uh, um, it's just a regular case for the iPhone. In fact, we're working right now, hopefully, with at and We've sent samples to AT&T. Um, we do a, a case. Can you hit that? Uh, we do a case called the Treads. This is just the regular, and they're available in all sorts of colors. This is the iPhone case. But we also, throughout our whole line, we have a product line called the Treads, which is kind of like a, it's, it's like a rubber tire, like a car tire. I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen, but it's kind of like got tread on it. Um, and so, um, yeah.